Welcome back to Final Fantasy Negative One. Today we are going to explore the Gurgu Volcano in this uh, beautiful world of Final Fantasy Negative One. First, we're going to take a look at Crescent Lake to show you some of the differences right there. And I'm sorry I didn't capture this on the screen, uh, but this character right up here on the top just randomly says, Here, take this canoe. And that's all he says. After that, he goes to sleep and just says, Z, 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 Z. Uh, if you recall from the very first video of this, the Circle of Sages seems to be in Coneria now, and they kind of give you some tips about how to play the game. And there are no sages in Crescent Lake. You can't take the little secret uh, path that goes from the main part of Crescent Lake all the way out through uh, to the Circle of Sages. So we have the canoe and we are going to head over towards the volcano. Now there are quite a few areas in this game that are open to us once we have the ship, but I'm going to play it uh, more or less for now in the order that the uh, original vanilla game was designed to be played in. Uh, once my characters are a little bit stronger, I will be taking care of some of the other dungeons, but the, the designer of this game really did let you uh, explore this world quite a bit. Um, they opened things up, so there is an island south of Melmond, that looks like it has some of the key items in the game, like the, um, the the loot and the rod and a few other things that are in a short dungeon right there. I do remember that from the um, FF Ultra run. So I will have to, I imagine, collect those at some point. Um, also, once I unlock this, I can go back to the Temple of Fiends and see if anything has changed in the, uh, the basement or whatever the warp tile takes us to in the Temple of Fiends to see if those earth or fire emblems have been changed with the trapped squares. I will be able to handle those battles a lot more easily now. Um, and then, of course, the whole northern continent is open to be explored. And I'm curious to see what it looks like if you have the ship and you don't need to worry about docks. Can you just go dock right by um, towns like Gaia or Onrak? Uh, well, Gaia, I guess, traditionally was in the, um, in the mountain range. But Onrak is right there on the coast. Meanwhile, we're going to be talking about the volcano. Uh, B1 of the volcano looks an awful lot like it does in the vanilla version. You can see my new level 5 spells right there in the Black Mage. I've got Bolt 3, Fire 3, and the ever-important Warp spell. The Warp spell is the best that the Black Mage can do in terms of getting you out of dungeons. And it can be useful later on in getting out of the Temple of Fiends Revisited. The only way in the vanilla version that you can get out of that dungeon is with a warp spell or an exit spell. That's the only way you can get out, I believe. And so that was one of the reasons why in my vanilla runs as a kid, I used to always have to have a white wizard because I was like, how else will I get out of the Temple of Fiends Revisited? Not really realizing that you don't really have to get out of it once you're in it. You can just prepare yourself outside of the dungeon and then do it in one crawl because you have to do it in one crawl anyway. It's not like you can advance any progress in the Temple of Fiends Revisited. You just die and go back to your save file. Uh, the battles with the fire elementals, they are escapable in this one. Uh, I believe in the vanilla version they are not, but in this one they are. We learned that in the very first uh, look at the Temple of Fiends when I was running from them to get the um, early access to the TNT. Uh, this B2 level of the volcano is always a, um, a pain, but it's quite a lucrative pain to have to deal with because there are lots of treasure chests, but um, there's a convoluted maze in, this, in the main part of this room that you can just walk right on by it and just go right down to B3, but uh, of course you're missing out on quite a bit of, uh, of treasure. Now, in the vanilla version, there, are, there aren't any super significant items in there. It's mostly just lots of gold and lots of mundane armor. But at this point in the game, you want that gold and the mundane armor to sell that you can uh, then get yourself caught up because uh, spells, especially at this point, are so expensive. Spells and equipment uh, really spike up in price here. Um, but in this one, I don't know what's going to be in here. There might be something significant there. There might be something unique. There might be something that I can really make use of later. So I am going to be pretty thorough here on B2. Uh, if you don't really care to see crawling through all of these mazes and fighting lots of battles, feel free to slide through. A tip that I like to use on uh, lots of Let's Play type videos like this, if you're exploring, 
which is kind of what I like to make uh, my videos about, is exploring a game, looking at it, seeing what's in there. A good way to watch this on YouTube is to turn the speed up to 1.5x speed, or 2x speed even. Uh, it doesn't change the pitch of the voice, it um, it just skips some, some frames on that. So um, the 1.5x is a good way to watch some of these, especially on Final Fantasy 1, where you're not going to be missing a whole lot as we are running from a set of four minotaurs here. You'll notice I do fight some battles in this one uh, because I've surmised that some of them seem to be inescapable, uh, but does, doesn't tell you when they are. That's one thing that uh, I do wish that all ROM hacks of this game did. I've seen it in some ROM hacks. I'm thinking of Final Fantasy ZZ specifically. Um, there is a little proc at the beginning at the bottom of the screen that says can't escape at the beginning of any battle that is inescapable. So you can, that the flag of inescapable is visible in some hacks of this game. I am not sure if FF Ultra, um, which is kind of a remix of this remix, um, incorporates that into it. I, I need to go back and check my video on that. Please go back and check that video on my YouTube channel, Final Fantasy Ultra Champion Edition, which is um, a remix of this remix. Uh, and I believe this is the battle where I discover that uh, it seems like this enemy combination is inescapable because I go for a couple of rounds trying to run from the giant iguana combo. Um, and we do not get away. After a couple rounds of running, um, I see that we can't escape. And I'm, I'm guessing that flag was put on here because this is a trapped square. This is a trapped battle in the Temple of Fiends in the Mystic Key doors. Um, but it took me two rounds of trying to run away before I realized that this is actually a, uh, an inescapable fight. So now we've already taken quite a bit of damage. And we're kind of fighting for our life here. The ninja is going to drink a potion for the uh, black mage, trying to pick up 100 hit points for him. And indeed he does. And so 140 hit points there. So kind of a random value in there. I believe it is an even 100 or right around an even 100 when you use it in menu. Seems like it uses it like a spell almost here in battle, which I think is also the case in vanilla. But it's much, much weaker. It has an effectivity um, rating. But I don't have the, uh, the list of that in front of me. Uh, something important to note here is that the ninja is now my uh, most important healing character because the ninja did pick up some charges of level 4 magic and the ninja can learn the life spell. Um, so the ninja actually has two charges of a life spell. The, the paladin will pick up level 4 magic. The paladin knows the life spell but does not have any level 4 charges as of yet. So uh, the Paladin cannot yet cast life, but I will have two casters of the life spell um, as this game goes on, which is going to be very helpful for me. The ninja also can pick up the, um, the Chakra spell, which is kind of a cool um, monk-like spell in the Final Fantasy series that is self-targeting only, um, but it will give you a full heal. And then at level 4, also, the ninja has picked up the haste spell, which is the like the fast spell of the vanilla version that uh, doubles your number of hits. And so as the ninja already has 4 hits at this point, um, doubling that doubles it to 8. So um, if you're casting it on an already very um, high accuracy character that already has a number of hits, um, the spell becomes even more effective. Whereas on the viking... Um, the Vikings using a hammer, later an axe. Those are lower accuracy weapons. So the Vikings are always going to be doing two to three hits in this game. Right now we're on two hits with our with our hammer and our axe. Um, so that gets doubled just to four. So you'll get more damage per hit, but you get fewer chances at the critical. So we notice our ninja with the Tempest Katana is already at four, doing less damage per hit, but uh, more chances for hits to go critical, and then criticals can be really great uh, at this point. So here's the Slasher Axe, and here's what we're going to be examining. We have a Gaia Hammer um, right now that we picked up in the Earth Cave. So we're at 7156, and 7156 turns into 7738. So you see five damage more per hit, um, and that, of course, can be doubled. Um, so it's 77 to 154, whatever whatever that doubles to. Um, so, um, but the accuracy is lower. So the odds of the Viking landing uh, two hits every time are going to be lower. But I'm going to go with the Slasher for now. Uh, this, uh, this battle of Iguana and Giants, I'm presuming it is the same kind of enemy formation of like one to... 
four giants and one to four iguanas, or there's that's how the game checks it. So a certain number of this and a certain number of this. But anytime I see giants and iguanas together, I'm going to be assuming that it's inescapable. So I'm glad I went back and picked up the slasher axe. And here's another one of the same battle formation. So we're going to fight this one again. And the ice twos are always going to take out the um, the iguanas. And I'm going to be pretty pretty liberal with my use of spells here in, in B2 because uh, we are going to go out and recover after the um, after B2. Which is how you should play the volcano even in a vanilla run, if you're not doing a speed run, of course. But you, you go in, you crawl through it, you pick up the golden experience of the trapped battles and the uh, all the chests. And then typically you would go back to Crescent Lake to sell off all of the redundant pieces of armor that you found. Because you find lots of like iron gauntlets and, and helmets and um, things that uh, your fighters can use but you might already have. Or uh, if you only have one fighter, you're going to get extra copies of stuff. So you go back and you sell off all that money, then maybe you can afford to uh, restock your heal potions, get back up to 99 with the money and the treasure you find in here. Then you can come back uh, with 99 fresh heal potions, and then you can just run right through this floor. So you see I decide to come out through this door, um, and we're going to go into the next area, and you really end up wasting a lot of steps in this one. Um, just because of the narrow view of the screen. We've talked about this in other um, other videos in the Final Fantasy series. One of the things that uh, really bumps up the challenge level for dungeons in Final Fantasy 1 is the, the very narrow um, perspective you have with the screen ratio. It said, like, you can't see which of those paths go anywhere. I'm kind of examining the walls. All right, where does it look like I might be able to go? And so there's a big space up there. I don't know what's up there. Who knows what's going to be going on up there? Um, you don't know until you go up there. You might find you're a dead end. And then meanwhile, you've wasted steps and you run into another battle with seven rogues, which always seems to be a back attack. So the uh, the rogue enemies are always going to be or, or very, very likely to be back attacks. They have a, the very high uh, preemptive chance, kind of like the, uh, the shadows do in the vanilla version of the game where they seems like they sneak up on you all the time. So a trap square with the fire, and then usually I can one round a single fire, so I will fight them when they pop up, because I can usually get them in one round. The two fires um, on, this, on this run, I'm going to be uh, ignoring those usually and running away. So I got both hits to land from the slasher, so pretty good on the crit rate there too. 750. Um, and so here I see that this is just a dead end. So this whole area right here, that whole doorway is all just for those two chests. Going in that door gets you just those two chests. Uh, the red giants, uh, they're going to be a different battle formation than the giant iguana combo. And so I'm just testing to see if you can escape. And indeed you can. But here's another one of the giant iguana. And I'm just going to go for the uh, the fights on this one. I don't have any more charges of ice too, so I'm just going to go for the regular attack and maybe two rounds of attacking with that the mage knife will uh, will go after the iguana. Um, something I've been considering with the mage knife um, that the uh, that the black mage is carrying is that it lands critical hits or not critical hits, but it's but it's effective against the magic type enemy is something that I'm guessing. Um, because I was seeing that it does really great damage to the Pisco Demon and Squid type enemies. And in the vanilla version, there is a sword called the Rune Sword. R-U-N-E Sword. And that is supposed to be um, effective against magic type enemies. Um, the mage type is a, is a very narrow type in the vanilla version. And so I'm guessing that that is where it's super effective because I've seen other things that seem to be weak to lightning or should be weak to lightning like the, the Pisco Demons are supposed to be or, or should be. Um, and it doesn't do it to them. So I'm guessing that those the uh, Mind Flayer type enemies must have a mage or magic type. And the Mage Knife, which makes sense because it's called Mage Knife, um, puts the extra effective hit on them. A little bit later on, we're going to see that our Tempest Katana seems to have a, uh, an effective hit against dragon-type enemies. I don't think it has an ice element to it. Um, I, I don't know if it has an air element to it. Also, could be. Um, and it could be that the uh, the red dragons we'll see in a little, uh, little bit have a weakness to the air element, because the arrow spell is also air element. 
but it also could be a dragon type. So there's a flame ring. Flame ring is going to be very helpful uh, because I believe it's going to give me uh, protection against the against the flame. So we are going to trade the flame ring for the ruby ring. And uh, we're going to have to drop some of our other equipment here as we're picking up a few more things. And we got a potion cottage. We have some more mundane things. I'm expecting a trapped square right in there. And I do not see one, which is interesting. Very cool, though. Um, this, in the vanilla version, this has lots of worm-type enemies. So, um... Gray, gray worms, I think they are, or maybe they're just called worms. It might be gray worms in this one. It's been a while since I played the vanilla version of the volcano. But there's a lot of trap squares with worm-type enemies. This one with the fire, I'm presuming is a trap square, so I'm hoping that there is the most important piece of equipment um, in, in this one right here. There's a slash for just a few on the fire. And so right there, that does not look like it's hitting into a weakness. And so if the fire elemental is fire type and there is some kind of um, some kind some kind of uh, air element being uh, strong against fire, I don't think it's going to be showing up. So when the red dragons take big hits from the Tempest Katana, I think it's into their dragon type, not their fire type. But I don't know. I still don't have a comprehensive um, of mechanics guide for this patch of the game. So I don't know what the um, enemy types are or the weapon types are. These are all just me uh, surmising by observation. So I'm gonna be losing some money here by dropping some of the other stuff. Um, triangle hat's gonna go to the ninja for a little bonus. The diamond gauntlet gets equipped. I've got a mithril helmet and a ruby ring that uh, I need to get rid of to make room for more armor as we pick it up. But uh, I'm done with that treasure room. I forgot about that trapped uh, tile. I probably should have just walked right around it, but it doesn't matter. We can just run from that fight for two fires. And then we're going to be going on to B3. And uh, again, like I said before, when we go down the steps to B3 and we uh, load up uh, B3, it will be with a full uh, party recover. But I saved you the uh, the time of having to uh, go walk all the way back out, recover up, buy all the heal potions, go to the inn, say all that stuff. So we have left that part out of this uh, video because it's going to be long enough already going down through the last few uh, dungeon floors. And so because I am going to be um, <laughs> going out here and recovering after this video, I just decided to, uh, to burn one more big spell just because I get very angry at these rogues. And I'm guessing that they're going to uh, cough up some pretty healthy cash if they go with their uh, their standard pirate uh, sprite types. I'm guessing they're going to be letting us have some pretty good money. And I do I kind of lay, I put random attacks at various parts of the uh, formation, so didn't quite get that last one standing. There we go, got that last one. And let's see. 2800 so almost 2900 gold so they they do li live up to their uh, to their sprite type and as we go into the next floor um, we have a full party heal up so through the magic of video editing you don't have to watch all the all the recovery so here is where I'm not sure if this is a uh, an inescapable encounter but I decide to just fight it out anyway because uh, it could be that it's like one to four giants and zero to three um, iguanas, something like that. So this could be the same formation as the other one, I believe. So I decide to just fight this one out. And there's the uh, the black mage getting three hits and finishing off the giant with 34 damage. MVP. The slasher axe is doing pretty good. It seems like it has a pretty high crit rate, and it gets two hits, so two chances at the critical. Um, periodically, as the, as the, I keep wanting to say dwarf because that shares the same sprite as the dwarves from Final Fantasy IV, or a very similar sprite as the dwarves from FF4. Um, as, as he levels up, I will have to check the accuracy because I would rather take three hits with a hammer and a little bit less damage than two hits with an axe, even with a higher crit rate. So I'm going to keep the Gaia Hammer around. Uh, the Gaia Hammer, by the way, if you watch the Earth Cave video, was in the um, second to last floor of the Earth Cave uh, that I skipped in that video. 
uh, and I went on to fight Lich. So I went back down to pick up that Gaia hammer. Um, it was in another uh, protected square by a golem and some squids. So you did see me pick up the um, the dark fell sword that was protected by the rock golems. So I went back down. It was protected by some uh, clay golems, the yellow one was. Um, so these floors usually go pretty quickly in the volcano because the lava tiles don't advance your step count and you cannot get random encounters on them. So we get to watch and listen to the wonderful sound of walking over trapped lava tiles. And I'm just going to be downing copious amounts of potion because I have plenty of potions and I'm going to save my harm spell charges for any big groups of undead. And so this floor um, has a mix of regular tiles and lava tiles. So I'm moving around a little bit uh, to see if I can pick up uh, the flame sword is typically in the volcano here somewhere on one of these floors. And it's, a, it's usually protected, so we're going to be trying to pick up the flame sword. And then later on in the vanilla version, there is the flame armor, which is on the same floor as Carrie, guarded by a red, a red dragon. So those are just things that you remember from the vanilla game. And a lot of times the hacks of these games kind of play with the uh, play with the meta of the vanilla game. They kind of uh, make nods to it. They kind of let you know that uh, they love the vanilla game. And so you use the knowledge of the vanilla game and playing other hacks of this to kind of surmise where things might be and how things might work. So when you play these games a lot, you kind of have an idea of what to kind of expect, what to look for, and what the, the designer of the hack of the patch has decided to play with a little bit. So having a, a strong appreciation and a lot of knowledge of the vanilla game really helps you appreciate these hacks a lot more. And which is why I usually recommend playing, um, if not the straight vanilla version of a game, playing something like Final Fantasy Restored, which is um, meant to just take the vanilla game and, uh, and just kind of smooth out that balance a little bit and fix some bugs in it. So it doesn't change a lot uh, drastically. It just makes things work the way they were probably supposed to work with the vanilla game. Um, and then at that point, I like to tell people to experiment with um, some of the hacks that are more total conversions of this game. I know most patch authors will tell you, oh, if you play one version of Final Fantasy, make it mine. Uh, I usually don't recommend that though. But Final Fantasy Restored is one that I really do recommend for a first time player of this game. And we get more of the delightful uh, lava flash which is wonderful, of course. But at least we have no random battles, so it lets you progress pretty pretty quickly because your step counter doesn't move and your uh, there's no, no battles in the lava. So I'm going to take a minute to heal up because every so often you just got to stop and heal up. Now, thankfully, with these potions that will heal 100, it's nice that you don't have to do that all the time and go over and over and over and over again. And you don't have to navigate a menu where potions are like at the far bottom left of your menu. Now I may have missed a chest in this floor, um, a, a chest room in this floor, but uh, if I find the steps, I'm usually moving on. And so uh, before we enter this room, I'm gonna heal up because uh, you never know when there might be a trapped tile right here. And no trap tile entering the room. And just two potions, so it's going to be just restoring my uh, my potion supply. It's worth it to just go in there and see what it is. All right, here we go. And there's another potion. We had a little video hiccup there in the capture, but we got another potion in that one. Here's a back attack from the rogues. And the rogues, again, are always or almost always going to hit us with a back attack. Their, um, their surprise rate seems to be very, very high. I don't think I've ever seen them not in a back attack. But, of course, that means if you can back attack, then you can escape. So, And here is going to be a lucrative room, we hope. So we're going to heal up all the way. Again, just in case there are um, a trap square in the, in the entrance area. Okay, nothing there. Nothing there. Nothing there. And the amulet. And here's where I think I make a slight um, menuing error because a um, one of the dwarves told me that amulets can grant you some protections, but I cannot remember if the amulet um, gives you the elemental protection. Like if the amulet would give me fire protection, uh, I should have spread that out because the ninja is going to have fire protection from the flame ring. Um, and so the amulet really should be spread out to another character, and we'll see that kind of bite me in a little while. Uh, I wasn't thinking carefully enough. See, the shell spell right there that I pointed to, 
that is supposed to provi provide you elemental protection for everybody. So that would be fire, ice, um, lightning, and I believe air. And then will gives you um, the other ones, poison, earth, dark, uh, and holy. Now, we got a nice hit there on the red dragon, but the biggest biggest risk of the red dragons right now is their blaze uh, skill. I don't know if they have it in this patch at this time, so I'm just kind of desperately trying to get those dragons out of the way because that blaze skill is going to be really, really nasty if it comes out and we're not protected. Because right now the ninja has uh, two items that should protect from flame right now on. Instead of spraying that on, my ninja will have the, um, the protection, the elemental protection, but the other characters will not. But we did get both of the dragons down, and now we just have a fire to deal with. The fires in this one, um, as I believe in the vanilla version, just do physical attacks. I don't think they seem to have a, um, a, a routine. I think they just do attacks. And there's the flame sword right there. So that's going to be a really nice pickup. And I'm going to try it, although I'm, n I'm never sure in in this game if, if uh, flame and ice weapons are effective against flame or effective against their opposite. Because there was some confusing language in the manual of the vanilla version that I had when I was a kid, and I've, that has always just confused me in my head um, as to what is supposed to do what. Of course, in the vanilla version, weapon types and enemy types don't work at all. So it doesn't matter um, what you use. You don't get any bonus or penalty um, from from using a weapon type. But uh, we will find out here in a minute that the uh, the flame sword is not the best to use in this dungeon because uh, the flame type enemies they don't absorb it because that's not really worked into this game. But they they resist it down to almost nothing. Um, but there was some confusing language that a flame sword is um, effective against flame enemies, like the giant sword is effective against giants, and the were sword is effective against uh, the werewolf or, or lycanthrope type enemies. But without the ability to switch weapons in battle, uh, it it's, was almost a silly um, inclusion to have that in here. If the designers of the vanilla game, and here's a couple of chests that usually are protected by agamas, in this case, uh, here we have two red dragons again, and I have to be careful about my spell charges here because Ice 2 is in the same level as Haste, and I am going to really want those Haste castings against Carry. So there's the Blaze skill, uh, doing really solid damage to my Black Mage. So if the Black Mage gets hit with another Blaze, it's going to be trouble. And there I attempted my Ice 1 spell, um, wasted that one, but it's not as important on that level. So he's just going to drink a potion and rely on our physical characters because it seems like they can one round a dragon. Although the uh, Viking did not get a critical hit off. So we are probably not going to be able to one round until I see that the ninja gets four hits for over 700 damage. I don't know if you saw that. Uh, and there is a fire staff. So that was very, very um, exciting to pick up for my black mage. A fire staff. I am presuming that that casts fire too on all enemies like the Mage Staff does when used in battle. I don't actually try it in this run, I'm sad to say, um, because I don't expect it to do much damage against uh, most of the enemies we're going to run into down here. I'm expecting it's going to be resisted, as we saw the Flame Sword resist. Um, it's still much better to have the Mage uh, Dagger in his equip spot, but the Fire Staff, I'm hoping or I'm guessing, um, will cast Fire too. I have to test that out um, off recording because I did not test it out in this run. Because this run was uh, was tighter than I would have liked it to be. I kind of um, do the power leveling thing with these runs, but the difficulty level did spike up a little bit when I saw the, uh, the red dragon start to pop up and I still don't have any way to get elemental protections and you have multiple red dragons, they can be doing blaze, blaze, blaze. Now here is normally where the flame armor is in the vanilla version of the game. And uh, Pink Puff went ahead and left the candles in the same formation that they are. That's the way, or that's very similar. The candles are almost the, identically laid out and the chest is um, down there in inside the candles. And the other spokes of this room, because this, this bottom room has got um, the, the spokes that go out from the central staircase. They have mostly nothing and some other kind of mundane stuff in them. But here it looks like I'm going to have to be exploring all of the spokes 
of this bottom floor in order to uh, to find what I need to find. So here's a trap square right here. Uh, although it doesn't look trapped, it's just four minotaurs. So nothing too scary. But I'm already worried about my spell charges because I could run into who knows what down here. I could run into another multiple um, dragon, uh, dragon formation. So there's the wizard robe. Um, I'm not sure if the wizard robe actually grants me any protections from elements. Um, it could. It could be. But I have no idea. I have no way of knowing. Uh, the vanilla version, there are lots of... Uh, regular armor or mundane looking armor types that do pre prevent you or uh, give you some protections but uh, this one I don't know I would expect that a wizard robe probably would have protection from something uh, but I have no idea what so here's another chest with candles around it and I'm just always going to try to be prepared for the uh, the trapped square so I'm gonna try to have full health or as near to it as I can every time I approach one of these and here's the trap square and there it is so two red dragons and a couple of fires now here my ninja I'm gonna have my ninja attack the other dragon and I'm going to consider using an ice two I'm just like boy what can I use against these type enemies I probably should have just used that fire staff and seen if it did anything because I don't want to burn um, spells here but so there they go the ninja took out a dragon in one hit and there's a nice critical from the from the Viking. 136 on the dragon right there. And I did kind of stupidly burn an ice two on two uh, worthless fires. Although they did pretty nice damage to my ninja right there. So the ninja with the Tempest Katana seems to be really effective against the dragon type enemies. But again, um, I said before, without the ability to change weapons in battle, the weapon effectivity types are uh, kind of difficult to really plan for and use because you don't always know when you're going to be running into certain kinds of enemies. Now, I could it could save that uh, Tempest Katana for Tiamat, um, and and I could see if Tiamat has the um, the the type the dragon type. So the Mithril Male is going to go bye bye in uh, favor of the Flame Armor. So again, right now my Paladin. And my ninja have flame protection, and I believe the amulet. This is why I have to check. Um, I have to check on this one. I believe the amulet um, offers flame protection, although there's no way of knowing from the observations right here because uh, I would need to have spread this out. We will see some fire spells cast, and you'll see the difference in damage that uh, the middle two characters take from the fire spells of uh, Carrie. Now, in the vanilla version of the game, once you have the flame armor, I don't worry about anything else that's down here. But in a hack of this game, I need to check all the spokes because I don't know what else could be down here. There might be something else uh, of use down here. Maybe there's an ice sword down here that I need to uh, get my hands on to use against, uh, against Carrie. So, here we go. Now, Carrie in the vanilla version... Um, doesn't doesn't have the same type so she she kind of resists um, a lot of the magic even your ice magic doesn't uh, do a lot to carry but she is susceptible to statuses so the status element is kind of what carry is um, is weak to or susceptible to so the status spells um, you're gonna use on carry so here's the squids and the squids I believe are the enemies that have the magic type on them because you'll see uh, my black mage is able to get a massive attacks on them like 300 plus damage um, from a black mage onto these guys <laughs> Well, not this round because the black mage was targeting the same one as the ninja because I um, At that time this is the battle that kind of uh, gave me the idea that maybe these squids Have the uh, the magic or mage type and that's where my mage dagger gets its power because three hits for 311 is an absurd attack for the uh, for the black mage. Usually, it's three hits for thirty or forty is a, is a good attack for the black mage, and that's actually really solid physical damage for a black mage. Even in a, in a hack like this, that's really really nice damage for a black mage to uh, to throw out. So I have one more spoke to check before we go over to fight carry. And I'm just trying to keep everybody as as uh, high in the health as as we can. I need to start considering my battle plan for carry. Now, I'm kind of low on my haste um, charges. 
for my Black Mage because I was kind of silly in casting Ice 2s against the Red Dragons, but I was really just trying to get them out of the way as quickly as I could um, to avoid getting the Blazes. Um, so the Ninja also has some castings of Haste 2, and I need to consider how much I want to um, buff my characters before we go full on the offensive. Now my Viking is going to go full offensive right away. The Viking can't do anything else but attack. The Viking is almost a Berserker. Um, with the ability to drink potions. That's all the Viking can do right now. Um, so my ninja, though, can I can consider casting the Invis spell with the ninja. I can consider casting Protect spells. I will cast the Will spell in case Carrie uses, like, Bio or something like that, but I don't have access to the Shell spell. Here I'm looking at it again, just kind of going, wow, we... Why don't I have access to Shell yet? No level 4 charges, but I will cast the Will spell. I don't know what Carrie's going to be using, so I've got two charges of haste from the ninja, and the chakra spell can be used to recover his own hit points back up to full. And I have one more haste chart, so I have three hastes that I can cast, which is technically enough hastes to get all of my um, physical characters into haste status. So uh, we will see how we do against Carrie. She will show us the force of fire, and we shall burn in its flames. And there is Kari. I, uh, it's, I always say her, but it's, I think it's supposed to be Kali. Um, and I think it's probably a he, and it's, it's Kali. Or it's Merilith, I guess, in the later ones. So I don't know, but I usually use female pronouns uh, for Kari. So the will spell um, won't protect me against fire, but it'll protect me against, like, the bio spell or, or darkness or holy. Um, so 120, 60, 33... 98. So you can see the middle two characters resisted that fire attack. The amulet should have been on the black mage, or I should have tried the amulet on the black mage um, to protect him, and then he could have done that, or on the viking to keep the viking alive um, from that one. So you can see the, um, the damage taken right there, and here's where I'm considering. What do I do? Now that I've cast Will, what can my, what can my paladin do? I should have had my paladin doing more um, buffs right there. I should have had the paladin doing more buffs. And I'm out of haste spells with my black mage. And so I'm considering what can I do? I can heal, I can cast. How much do I want to go on the offensive and how much do I want to sit back? The black mage, uh, really once the hastes are out, the black mage can't do a whole lot to carry. And I want to see what carry's got for defense. And now right there, three hits, three damage is huge. And slow right there is also huge because it negates the haste that I had already cast. Um, so now that is Carrie's um, second spell in her routine. So she's gone spell, spell, fire three, and then slow. So um, she will she won't work her way back around to slow for a while now. So I can more safely cast haste um, here, and I'm just gonna look and see what can the black mage do because uh, there's no more haste. I don't have another powerful ice um, spell. So here's another fire three. And so you can see, again, huge damage on my characters. My Viking is um, getting weak already. And there's another three hits, three damage from my Paladin. So here's where I should just get smart and um, have my Paladin start just buffing us with whatever he can buff with. Now, Invis would be ideal, uh, but he doesn't have Invis at that spell level. That's the ninja's job. So the Paladin does have Protect. Protect is another one that I could or should be using. But so far, Carrie hasn't used any physical attacks, so I'm not sure how worried to be about Carrie's physical attacks. And the ninja has got eight hits for, you know, 70 damage, so not doing massive damage um, right there. The ninja is going to go for uh, looking to see if he has chakra charges. He does not does not have any chakra charges. Um, he has access to um, temper, which he could use. And I'm going to have the black mage be a healer if the black mage can survive. It won't survive another fire three casting. That will take out the black mage uh, at this point. And I've kind of given up on the black mage. And I should have had the um, black mage or the... Uh, the paladin right there again should have been buffing up, but the paladin didn't have much else to buff with besides the protect spell. And again, I haven't seen Carrie use any physical attacks yet at all. And here I'm just looking at what can the ninja do to uh, to get something going. We can cast temper on the Viking because we're the Viking's doing nice damage, and we're not do we're doing nothing with the the paladin. Um, he, sh he just can't seem to get over her absorb. So the Absorb of carry seems to be way too strong for the Paladin. The Paladin should have been drinking potions, too, for people. 
um, because the the Viking could have survived a lot longer had we been um, healing him earlier. Here I have two characters um, trying to drink potions, but Carrie's going to attack the Viking, and then we are going to dump two potions on the Viking's dead body. So I played this much too aggressive. Um, that Paladin should have been casting heal or drinking potions every round. Uh, and then the ninja should have been taking a little bit more time to get us invised up. But so far we haven't seen physical attacks. There's a big physical attack from Carry, however, um, which is trouble. Four hits for over 100 damage, and now I've got two characters alive. They're both protected from the fire threes, so actually I kind of want Carry to be casting fire threes right now. This is what I want her to be doing. I want her to be using her fire attacks because we both will resist them. And I see Carrie's got uh, five hits to land right there. She had four hits land before. I'm attempting the blind spell, and it misses. Now, Carrie is uh, susceptible to statuses like that in the vanilla version. So I'm thinking, wow, if I can blind her, then she can't land um, hits as well. And then when she hits herself with fast, I know I'm in trouble. So I'm, it's a little bit too late now to start casting invises uh, because we just got two characters standing because she's now going to be going for 12 hits. She's now going to be trying 12 hit attempts. And you can see she landed seven of them, even with, with one um, invis spell and the ninja's already high evade. She landed seven. So we, we, again right here, we should be sandbagging even more because we're protected from her fire spells. Her physical attacks are what really are going to hurt us. Is I should just burn the ninja all the way out of invis spells right here. Um, but I'm a little bit too aggressive because she's still going to be landing hits like that. Um, so I really should just have the Paladin drinking potions alternating for both of us. So Potion himself, Potion the Ninja, and the Ninja only doing invis castings. Um, but here I've got the Ninja going on the offensive because I think that I might be getting close on carry. And I think, boy, if I can get a few more good hits, so 8 hits for 61 damage, even with at least one of them going critical. Um, it's really, really bad. And here again, 8 hits for 22 damage. No criticals right there. So the um, the Tempest Katana seems to be barely getting over her Absorb. And the uh, the Coral Sword that my Paladin is using is not getting over her Absorb at all. That's why it's doing 4 hits for 4 damage. 8 hits for 94 right there. And I keep thinking, boy, any one of these hits, I should be taking carry out. And I'm just thinking, what can I do to help make us survive a little bit longer? And it really should have been just cast in Viz, because now she seems to be almost explicitly on physical attacks. I kind of want her going back into her magic routine, because if she casts Fire 3, that's going to do like 30 damage to both of us. Uh, but she seems to be really focusing on that physical attack, and I think that's just bad luck in the RNG. Um, because the way enemies do is they check to see if they use magic, they check to see if they use a skill, and if they don't do either of those, then they do a physical attack if they have magic and skills. I don't think I've seen any skills from Carrie yet. I've just seen magic and physical attacks. So she started uh, really heavy going down her um, her magic rotation. That got the fire two, the fire three, the slow on everybody. Um, the uh, She cast poison on us, but that missed on everybody, I think because of the will spell. So it did protect us from the poison. Uh, gave us um, advantage on that status. Um, and then she hit herself with fast, and it seems like since she's hit herself with fast, she was, uh, she's was she been doing nothing but physical attacks, which is what we don't want her doing. Anyway, the ninja does land the big hit, um, <laughs> finally, and we do get ourselves out of this dungeon just barely so i learned a lesson to play this a little bit more defensive than what i have been playing that's what we're going to take away from this run stay tuned for the next video where we're going to be doing some of the other dungeons around this world map we're going to check out some of the big changes in this game hit me up in the comment section if you have a question or comment or on twitter where i'm also active underscore ate we'll see you next time